This video is a follow-up to one I made a year ago called How to Understand Fascism, which got pretty positive reviews when it came out, and I think it still holds up. I think I did a pretty good job at explaining fascism so it could be understood, rather than simply abused and rendered as an insult, or a boogeyman to threaten other people with, or even a mental disorder or mass hysteria. I explained the importance of analyzing fascism sympathetically. I somewhat haphazardly and not entirely accurately laid out some ways fascism borrowed aspects of left-wing thought and strategy. And I got to the business of identifying what distinguishes fascism, which is a surprisingly controversial question. There's a whole book by the eugenicist intellectual A. James Greger called Interpretations of Fascism, which is all about the fact that nobody can seem to agree on what defines it in the first place. So, I put myself out there and offered my own theory, which is probably the thing in this video that I'm most proud of, because the military theory pretty much explains everything about the fascist mentality. Fascism is an effort to integrate the values of the military into the civilian sphere, and thus bring those two worlds closer together for a higher purpose of creating a strong and healthy nation. That's what it is at bare minimum. The fascist minimum, you could call it. I covered a lot of ground in this video, and I even offered some personal perspective on the topic, especially during the black and white section of the video where I talked a lot about nihilism. This video could have been called A Nihilist's Perspective on Fascism. I even opened it with a quote from the nihilist philosopher Emil Turan, a fitting quote on the dangers of belief taken from his book A Brief History of Decay. This quote is especially impressive given the fact that Turan himself was a supporter of Cornelio Codreanu's Iron Guard, which could be considered the Romanian equivalent of fascism. Reflecting on it years later, he said it was the worst folly of my youth. If I am cured of one sickness, it is surely that one. Turan was a very pessimistic person, so... I wouldn't expect him to go easy on his past self after undergoing a change of thought. However, his use of the word sickness does stand out to me because it conforms to an interpretation of fascism that I criticized in my video. The idea that fascism is no more than a mental disorder unleashed on a population that is gripped by fear and uncertainty, an inscrutable and inexplicable turn to irrationality motivated by hatred of change, the failure of our social systems, and the fear of people who are different from a perceived norm. If I did anything to either defend fascism or exalt its virtues in this video, this was it, where I proposed the idea that fascism was not a negative ideology, meaning it didn't merely exist to be against things that it didn't like, but rather it had a positive side to it as well, an affirmational side that promoted a new conception of life that excited people and brought joy to some people's lives. But while I did provide some of my own personal perspective on fascism, I didn't get a chance to really explain myself because I wanted the video to be about explaining fascism in a more or less objective way without making it all about my opinions. That's where this video comes in. In this follow-up piece, I'm going to be explaining how I actually feel about fascism. The title of this video is Why I Admire Fascism, and that title alone is probably enough to put me on several watch lists owing to the immense social taboo it has acquired. Saying you admire fascism is like saying you admire Hitler or Satan. As it happens, I do admire both Hitler and Satan, along with a good many other things that people despise, like death, taxes, and the black-eyed peas. But honestly, even saying you admire Satan, death, or the black-eyed peas is less politically incorrect than saying you admire Hitler or fascism. Kind of like how joking about murder is a lot less politically incorrect than joking about rape, even though murder is a worse crime than rape. There's just certain places you don't go, 
You just don't admit to admiring Hitler in polite society. I'm not trying to be shocking. I like Hitler. I do not. I, the, the Holocaust is not what happened. Let's look at the facts of that. And Hitler has a lot of redeeming quality. Well, CNN says why people are evil Nazis. So, I mean, I, I, I disagree with both statements, but I get the yeah, approach. I don't, I don't like the word evil next to Nazis. I think we need to look at... <laughs> Yeah, somehow in a room with Alex Jones and Nick Fuentes, Kanye West is the one who comes out looking the worst. Usually when people defend Hitler or express admiration of him, it's combined with a cluster of other problematic messages like, the Holocaust never happened. Or, it's not the Jews Hitler had a problem with, but rather the international Jews. You want to know what the real Holocaust is? Every single Jew who does not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, who follows this religion of Judaism, all of them are going to burn in hell. And I'm not here to give an explanation of all that material. I'll make a future video about the Jewish question one of these days so we can look at that in the proper detail that it requires. But I think since Hitler is the de facto face of fascism these days, his iconic mug presents a skewed portrait of fascism. If Hitler is fascism's representative, its ambassador to history, you're not going to see much in it other than biological racism, anti-Semitism, extreme conservative social engineering, genocide, megalomania, censorship, and vicious military expansionism, all of which are pretty unlikable traits, and all of which seem to define Hitler more than anything potentially admirable, like, for instance, his bravery during the First World War, which I do genuinely admire about him. However, Hitler's status as the public face of fascism is complicated by the fact that Hitler wasn't a fascist. He was very influenced by fascism in many ways, however, he never called himself a fascist, and Mussolini never called him a fascist. Hitler's movement had its own distinct identity, and it deserves to be recognized as such. And sure, in my previous video, I did say that Hitler's movement was a fascist movement, and in a sense, you can view it as such. There are certainly no solid semantical rules here. But on further research and reflection, I think we may have gotten our wires crossed here, because most people, if they refer to Hitler's ideology as National Socialism, will say that the Nazis were an expression of fascism. But I actually think it's the other way around. I think fascism was only one variant of the broader National Socialist movement that included Hitler's party, as well as other German nationalist groups during the Weimar period, the Falangists in Spain, the Iron Guard in Romania, the British Union of Fascists, Le Fachot of Georges Valois in France, and many other groups in Europe and America. Of course, some of these groups called themselves fascist, and so fascism can be understood as a generic banner under which to place this whole movement. But I still prefer the generic term national socialist because it is more inclusive, and it doesn't rely on adherence to any specific doctrinal principles as laid out by the people who invented fascism. If you call yourself a fascist, you are, on some level, deciding that your ideology is based on or inspired by the Italian dogma of classical fascism. If you call yourself a national socialist, you are making no such claim. The national socialist movement was, at minimum, an international movement of socialistic or anti-bourgeois ultranationalist, which got its start in France with writers like Maurice Barres, and then was brought into Italy, where it was taken up by Enrico Corradini, where it eventually evolved into fascism. Using the term fascist to describe this movement perpetuates a misconception that we can understand the entire movement by looking at Italian fascism as its progenitor. In reality, the movement didn't start in 1919 with the fascists, nor did it start in World War I. The broader National Socialist movement started with French intellectuals in the late 1800s who saw socialism as a way to tear down the culture of decadence and rationalism 
created by the bourgeoisie and capitalism. It was basically a grassroots form of conservative populism that attacked the bourgeoisie not just for economic reasons, but also, and perhaps primarily, for cultural reasons. This national socialism only later found expression in the politics of direct action all over Europe through its mass adoption by war veterans after the First World War. Fascism was only one of these expressions as it was consolidated in Italy through a government takeover. So with that said, it actually makes more sense to say that Mussolini was a national socialist than to say that Hitler was a fascist. Of course, this is ideologically speaking. If fascism is thought of more as a movement in history where certain tendencies recurred among politically active youth in various countries, then yes, of course Hitler was a part of the fascist movement. If this new wave of direct action among right-wing youth in the interwar period is generically termed fascism as to distinguish it from the more theoretical national socialism of the turn of the century, then I think it's entirely appropriate to call Hitler a fascist. But since Hitler is pretty much the only thing that most people know about fascism, it might surprise them to learn that the core tenets of fascist thought have nothing to do with those negative traits that define Hitler's legacy more than anything else. Not racism, anti-Semitism, genocide, megalomania, nor military expansionism are central to fascist ideology. None of these ideas appear in the doctrine of fascism. Well, except for arguably military expansionism, because after all, fascism is military, but even that's a bit of a stretch. And when you read the doctrine of fascism, you find a whole collection of other ideas that most people probably haven't even heard of. Ideas that, in my opinion, are actually quite inspired and visionary for their part. I think we've been conditioned to look at fascism a certain way, but this conditioning robs us of the intellectual inheritance that we are entitled to. It blindfolds us to the real contribution that fascism added to the world of political theory and philosophy, and it forces us to view the movement in an uncritically negative way that doesn't actually account for the movement's unique identity. Fascism is now a genericized term for any kind of military junta or neoliberal dictatorship, even though fascism is actually against neoliberalism. How do you like that? When I say I am interested in fascism, I think there is a tendency to assume that because I am a nihilist who also identifies with liberalism and socialism, I must be interested in fascism as a study of failure or out of morbid curiosity like the spectator who buys a ticket to see two locomotives crash into each other on a train track, as if I get off on studying other people's misery and stupidity. Now, to be fair, I do kind of enjoy that stuff too, but it certainly wouldn't interest me enough to nurture the obsession I've maintained over this subject for the last three years. If I wanted to study idiots, I would just spend all day on Reddit. This is the truth that I have been afraid to admit ever since I began studying fascism. I study fascism not because I am coldly fascinated by it, but because I admire it. In fact, when I started studying fascism, I had a strange experience where I was initially trying to defend American conservatives, whom I had a strong distaste for, from the accusation of being something much worse than a conservative, but in the process of investigating, I discovered that I actually had a lot more philosophically in common with the much worse group of people, who I found were not only entirely different from the conservatives, but were also quite intelligent and thoughtful, even if they were a bit crankish at the same time. And in fact, I got so genuinely interested in fascism that it actually started to worry me which is one of the reasons why I stopped reading about it and instead focused all of my efforts into making videos about Marilyn Manson. But even then, it was hard to totally escape the subject. My fellow Americans, we will no longer be oppressed by the fascism of Christianity. And we will no longer be oppressed by the fascism of beauty. I got burnt out on the subject because I was getting too interested in it, and I started to worry that something was wrong. Like, really? 
am I really starting to admire fascism of all things? That raised a red flag for me, or a black flag, we could say. And even though it was two years since, I still hadn't quite gotten over that insecurity when I made my previous fascism video, so the video ended up being quite cautious and conservative. I really didn't want it to look like I was taking the side of fascism, even though I couldn't help but be a little sympathetic to it. But now, after yet another year of distance and reflection, and a bit more research and reading, I've come to peace with my fascist sympathies because I have a clear conscience and I know exactly where I'm coming from when approaching the subject, and I know what ways I admire the subject while also being aware of where my differences emerge. I think people are encouraged way too often to think about and obsess over things that they hate, and they are always on the lookout for things to dislike. People don't put nearly enough importance on the value of getting along with each other. People often take advantage of opportunities to be rude and unkind to each other. Instead of looking for things to appreciate about other people, people tend to look for things to dislike about each other. It's sad that our culture isn't conditioned to appreciate the good things in life. All we can do is obsess over how much we hate the bad things, but that robs us of what really matters. Getting along with other people, expressing ourselves, and feeling free to be imperfect. That's why I like Daryl Davis so much. He attacked the Ku Klux Klan not with punches or deplatforming or public shaming and preachy moralizing, but with compassion and friendship. He got these people who were lynching black people earlier in the century to see that being friends with a black person could be a very enriching experience and that they could have a lot of respect for a black person. I got more respect for that black man than I do you white niggers out there. If everybody acted like Daryl Davis and approached the people we disagreed with in friendship rather than mutual hatred, we wouldn't have all the problems we are experiencing today. When this negative mentality intersects with politics, we get the failure of diplomacy, the failure of institutions, the failure of the media, both mainstream and alternative, and just a general pathetic indignation that does nothing to actually help our situation and instead serves to divide us and reduce our capacity for productive conversation and productive action, a culture that sees its God-given right to whine and complain as more important than being able to work together. To have a healthy political culture, we must learn first to accept our differences and seek common ground. But how does that principle affect our relationship with ideology? Well, I can tell you how I approach it. When I look at ideology, I'm not looking for an opinion to agree with. I don't place value in opinions. I'm looking for good ideas, and it doesn't matter to me where they come from. If it's a good idea, it's a good idea. And it doesn't matter if one good idea contradicts another good idea, because I don't believe in truth anyway, and I'm not against hypocrisy like most people are. I actually don't think there's anything wrong with agreeing with two contradictory premises as long as you are self-aware. One of my favorite philosophers, Osho, was a massive hypocrite, and that's part of why I like him. I don't believe in perfection, and I think existence itself is full of bizarre contradictions. Expecting everything to make sense is the first mistake people make when trying to make sense of things. So, rather than opinions, I'm more interested in perspectives. A perspective isn't necessarily a claim about what things are or what they should be. It's simply a way of looking at the world that is informed by a certain person's life experience. So, I am less about finding the right opinion and more about having an informed perspective. And that means taking in as many different people's perspectives as possible because each person's perspective will give a different vantage point from which to view a situation, and understanding more perspectives will make your own perspective more nuanced and informed. The fascist perspective presented a view of the world that I had been given no exposure to 
up until I started studying it. And I think that is unfortunate because I found that many of its ideas had a profound resonance for me. And I think our culture would benefit from being able to learn about these ideas as these ideas will inform all of our perspectives, not just about government and statecraft, but about life itself. Being deprived of access to these ideas only makes us more ignorant of the full picture. Whether you agree with fascist ideology or not, these ideas can help clarify aspects of whatever ideology you do entertain as your own because they give you another vantage point from which to view it. If you're a general on a battlefield, wouldn't you want to have as many different angles on the battle as possible? If you make the effort to understand different ideas in a sympathetic way, they will give you a more well-rounded view of the world, even if you end up entirely disagreeing with them. So with that said, let's look at some of the ideas of fascism, which already brings us to an impasse because there is a misconception among some that fascism has no ideas, or more accurately, that it has no philosophy, and whatever philosophy it does have is completely stupid. Some people will make the argument that fascist philosophy is nothing more than real politic. And I think this misconception arises from a few places. One reason is that fascist doctrine was only established after the king appointed Mussolini as prime minister in 1922. So effectively, fascism was a movement first and a philosophy later. But I would argue that this is a very natural and normal way for a movement to develop. When action is needed above all other considerations, people will tend to act first and then define their doctrine later. I think the labor union movement would have happened whether it or not it was backed by a doctrine that opposed private property, because the circumstances of the time necessitated immediate action even if the long-term goals of the movement weren't fully thought out yet. And of course, this is keeping in mind that even though the doctrine of fascism as a unique philosophy in itself didn't exist yet, there was still the national socialist tradition that had been around since the late 1800s that fascism pulled from in creating an ideology for the movement to rally behind in the years leading up to the official codification of fascism as its own distinct doctrine. As it started, fascism rather oddly resembled a democratic socialist party with the chief difference that it was nationalist rather than internationalist. As such, the movement attracted nationalists of all types. Some of them were extreme reactionaries, like the Morassian Integral Nationalists. Others were more revolutionary than reactionary, taking influence from the writings of the French syndicalist Georges Sorel. Sorel's revolutionary syndicalists were in the business of rescuing the revolutionary aspect of Marxism from the danger of reformist democratic socialism, which threatened to undermine the idea of revolution. As such, they placed way less emphasis on the scientific validity of Marxism, which they thought was largely irrelevant to motivating the proletariat into violence. Instead, they believed that democracy and reform were shams meant to keep the bourgeoisie in power. And what the proletariat really needed were myths and ideals to believe in that would motivate them in a pure and intrinsic way to organize, strike, and revolt. While revolutionary syndicalism was not explicitly nationalistic, because it was anti-democratic and anti-liberal, it did prove attractive to many national socialists, and it even proved attractive to the integral nationalists because it was against rationalistic thinking. When revolutionary syndicalism migrated into Italy, it was taken up by Enrico Corradini, who fused revolutionary syndicalism with integral nationalism, to create a new synthesis called National Syndicalism, which modified Sorel's ideology significantly and promoted corporatism rather than traditional syndicalism as their economic model. And then, of course, there were the Futurists, who embraced nationalism as a function of their eccentric fascination with all things dynamic, masculine, mechanical, and forward-thinking. And of course, there were the Arditi and other Italian war veterans who wanted Italy to get a good deal out of the peace settlement because that's what they were fighting for. 
and they also wanted to be rewarded for their service in the war with land and other amenities. Many of these people joined Gabriele D'Annunzio's proto-fascist takeover of Fiume in 1919, a movement fueled by art, romance, and corporatism. What the war generation certainly didn't want was for Italy to back down in submission to the interests of the international liberal elite and surrender all of their potential winnings in the name of international cooperation. But this is exactly what the socialists wanted to do since they didn't believe in the war in the first place and they only wanted to end what they perceived as a conflict of bourgeois interests competing against each other, which had nothing to do with the interests of the international proletariat. At best, socialists like Vladimir Lenin believed that the war could destabilize bourgeois aristocracy and empower the proletariat to achieve a worldwide revolution, but the general mood in the left in Italy was anti-war. Fascist doctrine, therefore, had the task of collating the interests of all of these pro-war dissident nationalist groups in Italy into an ideology that would represent what they all had in common, a rejection of the materialistic values of the socialists, and a reimagined Italian society united under more spiritual goals, which would address the concerns of each group in an organic way through the corporative system. Another reason why some people think fascism has no philosophy comes from the very popular Marxist interpretation of fascism. Now, what's important to understand about Marxism is that it's not just a political ideology. It also comprises a whole theory of economics and a whole theory of history. As a theory of history, Marxism is predictive. It looks at trends in human history from a materialist perspective and then makes predictions about what will happen if history continues to follow these trends. But basically, what happened between the 1890s and the 1930s was a series of historical changes that challenged Marx's predictions about the future. And so Marxists were left with the task of revising Marxism in order to accommodate these changes, to provide an interpretation of these changes through the Marxist historical lens. This led to a lot of splintering of the socialist movement into various rival factions like the Social Democrats and, of course, the fascists, who not only themselves constituted a revision of Marxism, but threw a whole wrench into the scheme of Marxian history. Therefore, the Marxists had to figure out how fascism fit into their model of history, and for many of them, their conclusion was that fascism is nothing but a bourgeois reaction to the imminent success of revolution, that it's the last-ditch attempt to save capital from its disillusion by marketing bourgeois values as proletarian, and that it represents a purely reactionary response against revolution. This is another idea I disagree with. However, it does have some bearing on reality. It is true that fascism was embraced by the bourgeoisie, but the bourgeoisie didn't invent fascism. Fascism was a spontaneous movement created by nationalists and idealists, not a manufactured marketing scheme for the bourgeoisie to sell people their own oppression by playing to their intellectual weaknesses, bigotries, and insecurities. But while the bourgeoisie didn't invent fascism, they did eventually come to accept it because fascism was the only movement that had the muscle to defeat the socialists through direct action. It would have been hard to create a liberal syndicate to defend the capitalist status quo by attacking the labor unions, but a nationalist syndicate? That could work, because it was itself its own form of labor movement, and they were radical and authoritarian enough to take matters into their own hands. So the bourgeoisie might not have invented fascism, but they certainly influenced it. You might even say they co-opted it. But as the recently deceased Israeli intellectual Zeev Sternhell pointed out, it's very common for radical parties to make compromises in order to secure support and get things done. 
Social Democratic parties today are basically center parties that have very little to do with their original radical left-wing vision. Fascism needed the support of the liberal elite and the king, so they had to make compromises to secure that support. Plenty of movements sell out, and then there will always be hardliners who criticize the movement for selling out and call for a return to the original program. I'm not defending the rightward turn of the party, but I am defending the party from the accusation of being a bourgeois invention and therefore lacking any genuine principles. Fascism was always deeply philosophical. It is a philosophy as much as it ever was a movement, and its philosophy can be traced back long before the beginning of the movement. When we look at National Socialism, we see a lot of talk about values and how different values are expressed in different social classes. I would argue that splitting up society into bourgeois values and proletarian values is kind of stupid in the first place because there's so much variation in opinion and approach within social classes, and you can't just say that everyone of a given social class is going to have the same values. However, if you will permit me to engage in a bit of argumentation just for the sake of it, I would argue that if we are to split things into bourgeois and proletarian, then the core values of fascism were never bourgeois in character. The bourgeoisie generally is, and was back then, liberal. It is international. It values free trade, neoliberal economics, and consumerist materialism. Fascism's more spiritual, conservative, and paternalistic ideas are far more proletarian than bourgeois. They represent the way people of a poor background with less education actually think, and they champion and justify what is snidely derided as ignorance and superstition by the more educated elites, of whom Jewish people number very disproportionately, which, of course, adds fuel to the discontent between Jewish people and the National Socialist movement. Instead of deriding the traditional values of the proletariat, fascism defends and exalts these values as true to the national character. Rather than trying to change the country's beliefs into something more cosmopolitan, and hence bourgeois, fascism embraces the prejudices of its national community and works within that framework to achieve progress rather than against it. Fascism is affirmational rather than deconstructive. Where I'm standing, I am agnostic to the question of nationalism versus internationalism, and I think it's a bit of a false dichotomy. But I do agree much more with the deconstructionist, cosmopolitan end of the argument. I'm pretty much a positivist, although I am a bit superstitious. I am superstitious enough to get scared of ghosts every once in a while and to think that quantum physics is magic. I'm also pretty suggestible to placebos or nocebos. And in the end, I think life is a fundamentally illogical phenomenon, so I can't ultimately believe in an entirely rational worldview. I do believe morality is subjective, and I do believe human beings have spiritual needs. I think humans invented religion for a good reason. It makes us feel better about our lives, even if it is just a placebo. It can help to have a metaphysical framework for understanding the world, and having a place carved out for yourself in that framework. It just makes you feel a bit more snug in life, like there's some reason for you to be here, and there is some context you can add to your suffering so that you feel a little bit better about it. Liberalism generally didn't reject religion, but seeing how it promoted rationalism, it attracted many atheists. Socialism went even further, and Marxist philosophy was pretty explicitly materialist and anti-theist. Since I am an atheist and an anti-theist, I can't really complain about this development, and in fact, I wish it were more successful. But. I do think that something is missing from life when you get rid of God. You might not notice it at first, and you might never notice it, but I think there's a big gaping hole in a lot of people's lives who don't believe in God, and I don't think that can be filled by anything 
but spirituality. I do think understanding the world metaphysically can be a helpful thing sometimes, and that's why I can't totally get behind the bashing of fascism for being superstitious. Fascism puts a lot of value on metaphysics and idealism. It has a view of the world that rejects rationalism quite explicitly, actually. It also rejects universalism. The third estate philosophies, as I will call them from this point forward, talking about liberalism and socialism, these philosophies usually position themselves as rational, and therefore cutting through all of the inherited cultural bullshit that clouds our judgment and makes us think we are different from other people based on our race. And when I say race, I'm also talking about things like creed and nationality. According to liberalism, all men are created equal. Although that hasn't stopped many liberals from owning slaves due to the loophole that technically black people aren't really men, are they? Yeah, well, the more mainstream philosophical side of liberalism tends to be universalist. The conservative tradition, as it developed in America, isn't quite that. They still protect these inherited cultural ideas about their own race. So in that way, the people in America who are most likely to entertain the ideas of fascism are the conservatives. And fascism at its core is a right-wing ideology. The conservatives who feel most at home in fascism are really the far-right paleocons like Nick Fuentes, who is basically a fascist, even if he doesn't really know much about fascism. But the point is that fascism is particularist, which means it doesn't assign a universal moral code to an entire world full of individual beings. Rather, it sees morality as a racial construct. And once again, I'm not talking about biological racism like in Hitlerism. I'm talking about race as something more akin to nationality, although I don't mean to imply that race and nationality were considered the same thing in fascism, because that's not true either. But what I mean is that each nation in fascism has its own moral program suited to its own racial character, and that then will naturally place each nation in its own autarkic bubble. Hence the idea of ultranationalism, which according to Oswald Mosley meant that every nation was out for himself and the rest can go hang. The way I explained this in my last video was to say that fascism could be viewed as an extreme individualist philosophy on the level of the superorganism, on the level of the state. Each state is in competition with the other states and looks out for only its own interests, because when each nation has its own racial character and its own self-interest, it is impossible to expect that they'd all be able to work together on common goals. So fascism is more interested in advancing the deep subconscious impulses of its racial consciousness than creating some rational worldview to check all of its biases. And as such, fascism kind of just embraces its cultural biases and doesn't really care for the people who are trying to subvert or undermine them with logic and reason. Of course, this doesn't mean that fascism is necessarily a super repressive regime with no freedom of speech, but it does mean that preserving this kind of freedom of expression is not really a priority for them. What do I think about all this? Well, this is something I don't really like about fascism, but I can at least see where they're coming from, because one true thing that they're recognizing is that reason has its limitations. If you reason too much, you'll end up reasoning yourself into a black hole of nihilism, where nothing is true, nothing matters, and everyone's gonna die. Or maybe that's just me. But certainly the world tests you by presenting no certainties, and it's your job to figure out how to live with that. And that's one of the strengths of the Oriental tradition over the Occidental tradition of philosophy. The Occidental tradition puts the philosopher in the position of figuring everything out. And thus the philosopher becomes against the world around him, as the world around him is his obstacle to triumph over, by discovering its secrets and figuring out all the ways to make it into something more profitable to him. Oriental philosophy usually focuses more on how to find harmony with the environment around you rather than conquering it, 
and therefore it can look at the lack of certainty in the world and not necessarily see that as a major obstacle to understanding, but instead look at that as a prompt to find harmony with this uncertainty and come to peace with the temporary illusory nature of life. But if you are trying to reason your way through everything, you can come up against some difficult problems. Morality itself runs up against a lot of logical paradoxes, such as the trolley problem, that make it difficult to know what the hell you're supposed to be doing when every action or inaction you could take is going to benefit some people and hurt other people. So one thing I like about fascism is that it cuts through the bullshit of other people thinking they can cut through the bullshit with logic and reason. It recognizes that logic and reason can only take us so far before we become empty, confused, and paralyzed with indecision. It has a much more Nietzschean view of morality. They basically took Nietzsche's concept of master morality and applied it to the state. Master morality is self-determined. It's when we decide morality for ourselves based on what is beneficial to us, and we don't let other people convince us that hurting ourselves is the morally superior action. Since fascism conceives of a nation as a unified whole rather than a collection of individuals, it is the state that determines the moral course of the nation based on its own master morality, which is noble and self-affirming. Since I conceive of life as illogical, and therefore I think of the human being as a fundamentally illogical creature, I too recognize the limits of reason. I too believe that mankind needs a metaphysical framework if it wants to truly thrive in this world, and I too believe that sometimes you just need to bite the bullet and do the strong thing rather than wasting your time trying to figure out a morality that is subjective and therefore cannot be fully reasoned. So there is a lot in this end of fascism that I agree with, and I think you can take these principles to the extreme, or you can take them in a milder direction that is tempered by reason. I do think we should rely on reason for most of our decision making, but I also do recognize its limits. In fascism, reason is applied as a tool among other tools, but it is not the ultimate goal of society. Fascism recognizes that in human psychology, it is beliefs and ideals that fascinate us more than reason, even if we feel the need to justify those beliefs and ideals with reason. So it embraces that side of human nature, which it views as more motivating, leading to a more vibrant existence that is more life-affirming overall. And I can certainly see where they're coming from with this. I think it might be best to find some sort of synthesis between the logical and the mythological sides of man so that we can fully embrace the metaphorical and symbolic side of life while also recognizing its illusory quality. Like in Roman times when they had the triumph for the victorious general who was decked out in gold and purple and a slave stood behind him in the chariot and from time to time whispered in his ear, Memento Mori. Perhaps we need our stories. We need our faiths and our artificial ceremonies, but we also need to remember our own mortality, our own uncertainty, and the nihilistic reality of existence. But I at least admire fascism for championing that other end of human nature, the mythological, because I think it's important, especially for intellectuals who pride themselves in their ability to reason. Fascism's understanding of the mythological made it possible for them to really inspire people through propaganda and pageantry in a way that was sophisticated and intelligent. It's more than just marketing and brainwashing. It's giving meaning to life. And that's something that marks fascism in its setting. This was right after World War I, the Great Disillusion, which could also be thought of as the Great Disillusion. The myth of war being good for society was shattered. Dada and Cubism appeared to challenge notions of what is good art. 
the world got a whole lot more cynical in the span of four years, and God, he was more irrelevant than ever. Industrial capitalism made sure of that. In this intellectual, nihilistic, capitalist environment where religion was losing its importance in people's lives, fascism emerged. A religious movement with a starkly secular character. What was brilliant about this was that even though fascism considered itself religious, it didn't rely on traditional religion to find its strength and appeal. Otherwise, it would have just been another boring revivalist movement like they'd been having ever since the Reformation. And that wouldn't work because it would only appeal to the people who fully bought into that religion in the first place. So what fascism offered instead was an ingenious alternative, a secular religion centered around worship of the state and expressing devotion to the national community through the state while incorporating traditional Catholic worship into the scheme as well. That way, if you weren't convinced by the whole God, Bible, and Pope business, that didn't mean you had to lose your sense of religiosity altogether. You could still find a spiritual home in fascism through this more secularized outlet that retained the intense devotional and metaphysical meaning of Christianity, or perhaps more appropriately, classical paganism. Another thing I admire about fascism is its ethic, or perhaps its ethos? I'm looking for some sort of word between ethic and ethos, because what I'm really talking about is where fascism derives its zest for life, its vitality. This again can be traced back to Friedrich Nietzsche. Mussolini was fond of quoting Nietzsche's slogan, live dangerously. I'll let him explain it. My day consists of one hour of recreation, seven of sleep, and sixteen of work. Eating is a minor function of my existence, and is only a matter of minutes. Rumors that I am an invalid would gain sparse confirmation on my morning gallop. I feel that my massive body is strong in every fiber. I take life on a running jump. It is the life I am trying to instill in the hearts of militant fascists to be ready for the pulling of the leash, impelled by the thought of invincible destiny. My clarion cry is that it is necessary to live dangerously, which is the essence of a charmed life. The very idea of the fascismo is to be bound to a leader who will lift the torch of sacrifice and be the bravest of the brave. This I remember when attempts are made on my life. I forget the assassin's devices and pass on with my faith unshaken. This consigns me to the will of destiny which will guard me till my work is done. Danger electrifies me. My colleagues warned me against the assassin's bullet and the bomb and wanted me to have an escort or guards on the running board of my motor car or to take a circuitous course. I threatened that if such nonsense was perpetrated, I would walk to my office. My car is treated the same as others in the traffic. Everyone says it's the easiest thing to shoot me, but there has always been a mystic something to intervene between me and death. So, uh, before I continue, I just have to acknowledge the hilariousness of this very special man. But, uh, anyway, in fascism, just as in Nietzsche, death is something met head-on, and heroically. We don't shrink from death and make death into the master of life. We accept the inevitability of death and thus deprive it of its ability to hurt us in life. If we are always living our lives in fear of death, we will never get to enjoy the vitality of life, because to do that entails living dangerously. It entails putting yourself at risk. This slogan, live dangerously, is something that immediately took hold of me when I read it in Julius Evola's excellent book, Fascism Viewed from the Right, which I think is so far my favorite book on fascism that I've ever read. Ever since then, I have been saying this slogan to myself from time to time, and it has made a difference in the way I approach life and the things I'm afraid of. Another slogan I've been thinking of a lot comes out of Stoicism, and it's where Zeno of Kition, the founder of Stoicism, was being taught by a cynic philosopher in Athens, and his cynic teacher told him to carry a big pot of lentil soup from one location to another. And when he was done with this strenuous activity, his teacher picked up the pot of lentil soup, 
and in full view of everyone, dumped it all over Zeno's head. Zeno's feelings were hurt by this, and he tried to run away, but his teacher called out to him, Why are you running? Nothing bad has happened to you. I really like that idea. We are conditioned to fear discomfort, to hate humiliation, and to run away from our fears. But there's another way of living which embraces these things because it embraces life. It is a life-affirming philosophy that sees life as filled with suffering, and so it embraces suffering. And more to the point, it embraces the struggle of life. This is what I think Nietzsche was talking about when he made that joke about utilitarianism that I referenced in my last video about fascism. Mankind does not strive for happiness, only the Englishman does. I like that quote because it shows off Nietzsche's cynical sense of humor that he implies that the Englishman doesn't even qualify as a man because his philosophy on life is so misdirected. By the way, all of this stuff about Nietzsche was stuff I picked up while studying not for a video about fascism, but for a video about Antichrist Superstar. So that shows you the benefit of having multiple interests. You can apply things you learned in one study to a different study. But anyway, Nietzsche wrote about embracing life, and so he wanted people to think of life as a struggle. And the struggle gives us something to apply ourselves to. It gives us forward motion and vitality. And Nietzsche also understood that the flaw with utilitarianism is that it makes happiness the goal of statecraft, and by extension, the goal of life. But Nietzsche, as well as any Buddhist, understood the fundamental paradox of happiness, which is that the surest way to never find happiness is to go looking for it. Happiness is found when we are focusing on other things when we have something to do that motivates us beyond the concern for our own happiness, when we have a higher goal that is transcendent, it transcends ourselves. So even though I am a utilitarian, my utilitarianism requires grasping at some ideal higher than happiness as an indirect means of achieving it. But happiness can't be the goal. The goal has to be self-motivated and entirely genuine, rather than just being a Trojan horse for happiness. And this, of course, is a good argument for sincerity of belief, which goes against my more nihilistic disposition. Because the true enemy that I alluded to earlier is belief. If all you are after is happiness, you will fear what deprives you of happiness, and you will fear death, making life unlivable. We need something else to care about, and for fascism, that is the health of the nation. To elaborate further, I'm going to take a step back and look at the concept of rights. Rights are at the core of the third estate ideology. The Declaration of the Rights of Man is the foundational document of third estate politics, and it was inspired by the Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson, which contains the quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We already talked about the pursuit of happiness, but what I want to point out here is the metaphysics at play. In liberalism, traditionally, rights are a metaphysical phenomenon, and the state has no metaphysical property. This means rights are inalienable. They cannot be taken away because they are an abstract truth about justice as laid down by God himself. A state can infringe on your rights, but it cannot take them away, since the power of the state does not rest on any metaphysic other than the duty to protect those rights. In fascism, it is the other way around. In fascism, rights have no metaphysical quality because they depend on the state to exist. It is the state that has a metaphysical quality. The state is the one true expression of racial consciousness. And indeed, without the state, there can be no nation as such. A nation can only exist if it is cultivated and protected by a sacred hierarchy that exists to fulfill that destiny. Given this, fascists don't place much importance in rights. And according to Oswald Mosley, 
this was the basic error of fascism. The basic error of fascism was the disregard for liberty. I don't plead as guilty on that as other people should and, and must plead guilty, because I always stood against imprisonment without trial, even before I suffered it myself. And uh, I think, but I think the basic error of fascism was, in its drive for action at all cost, it overrode liberty. And the great problem of this present age is to synthesize the drive for action, which is completely necessary with the preservation of individual liberty. I tend to agree with this analysis. But part of the DNA that went into this aspect of fascism actually came, surprisingly enough, out of the Third Estate. It was the Republican Giuseppe Mazzini who first put into the Italian consciousness a certain skepticism over the concept of rights, even though he did believe in their importance. But where he differed from the rest of the Third Estate was that he believed only focusing on the importance of rights presented a lopsided view of the role of government in the civic life of the people. Rights are essentially what we are owed for doing nothing other than existing. They are basic human dignity that everybody is entitled to. There are negative rights and there are positive rights. Liberalism tends to value negative rights more, whereas socialism is more about positive rights. Negative rights state all the things that people, including the government, are not allowed to do to you. These include coercion, extortion, theft, injury, censorship, among other things. Positive rights are the basic life amenities that nobody should suffer the indignity of living without. A home, some food and water, education, and health care. But in either case, we are talking about individuals being entitled to something. It's a system of entitlement, protection, and taking. But Mazzini saw that if all you focus on in life is what you are owed, you're missing a key part of the picture. What are you going to give back? If everybody is taking, who is doing the giving? I don't mean this in literal terms necessarily. This is more of a mental phenomenon. It's about framing. It's about psychology. It's about how we see the government and our role in civic life. Giuseppe Mazzini believed that only focusing on rights would create a situation where people are obsessed with protecting their own property, fortifying themselves in these independent castles, or selfishly demanding what they are owed by society without thinking about what they owe to the system to maintain its overall health, and without viewing society as an active, participatory process. So he wrote a book called The Duties of Man as a response to the Declaration of the Rights of Man where he argued that rights are important, but they can only exist if we also recognize the importance of duty. It's not that Mazzini believed rights made people selfish, but rather he saw that civic life placed a lot of importance on them, but not on duties, which robbed humanity of its spiritual center. Mazzini argued that in order to create a populace that understands the importance of helping other people, this importance has to be stressed by the institutions that make up our society and enshrined as sacred in those institutions. People have to be taught to put duty foremost in life, thinking about what they can do to serve their family, their community, their nation, humanity as a whole, and above all else, God. I think this is a very enlightened perspective, and so did the fascists, because they really took hold of this idea and ran with it, making duty a matter of prime importance in their conception of life rather than rights. So back to the question of happiness. If the most robust form of happiness comes from pursuing a higher ideal and embracing the struggle therein, this higher ideal can be understood as a man's duty. Fascism, therefore, understood the psychology of human happiness rather well. It understood that duty is not only important for maintaining a healthy society, but it is also psychologically attractive in that it gives people a purpose for living, which in turn gives a man his zest for life. Oswald Mosley said something good about the ideal of fascist duty. He said, 
We demand from all our people an overriding conception of public service. In his public life, a man must behave himself as a fit member of the state. In his every action, he must conform to the welfare of the nation. On the other hand, he receives from the state in return a complete liberty to live and develop as an individual. And in our morality, the one single test of any moral question is whether it impedes or destroys in any way the power of the individual to serve the state. He must answer the questions, does this injure the nation? Does it injure other members of the nation? Does it injure my own ability to serve the nation? And if the answer is clear on all those questions, the individual has absolute liberty to do as he will. And that confers upon the individual by far the greatest measure of freedom under the state, which any system or any religious authority has ever conferred. The fascist principle is private freedom and public service. I find it a little bit interesting that uh, Mosley references religious authority at the end. I wonder if that is at all implicitly uh, to give the impression that fascism is a religious movement as much as it is a political movement. Because if it is, then I would certainly agree with that premise. The ideal fascist government is totalitarian in the Gentilian sense. This does not mean a heavy-handed authoritarian micromanagement and repression, but rather a totalizing of the goals and duties of the nation within the state. The state is the great collaborative organ of society that addresses the needs of every member through corporative representation and commits to programs that will prioritize and vitalize the health of the nation in a moral, practical, economic, and very literal sense of the physical body. In every way, the state exists to encourage and nurture good growth, and in return, it demands full commitment and service from its constituent members, which includes the entire population. Because remember, in fascism, every member of the nation is considered a member of the state because there is no distinction between nation and state. The state is totalitarian. It is totalizing everything within the state, nothing outside the state, and nothing against the state. I think most of us, since we are of a more liberal background, are conditioned to be anti-state in sentiment, even if we're anything but anarchists. And this is on both sides of the aisle. Even right-wing, flag-waving, warmongering conservatives who are head over heels for the troops are still oddly anti-government. I even remember this scary anti-vax witch woman who used to work around me calling herself anti-government, when what she really meant was that she was a Republican. So my point is that this kind of rhetoric is going to sound very extreme and very insidious to most people, but that's not really how I see it. I actually think it sounds like a very nice thing. I like this idea of unity of purpose and collective duty. Apes together strong. I think there's something beautiful about that in an almost hippie-ish way. And only through a mass mobilizing and all-encompassing institution like the state could you really achieve this kind of collectivism. And what's interesting is that because fascism conceives of the individual as a microcosm of the state and the state as a macrocosm of the individual, the fascist ethic of life can be applied on a microscopic personal level just the same as on a macroscopic state level. They mirror each other and support each other's existence. Without the individual acting as the best model citizen he can be, the state cannot act as the best totalizing collective force it can be, and vice versa. The fascist ethic and conception of life, therefore, ties the individual to the state in perfect symmetry. This ethic and conception of life was like that of the Spartan warrior, frugal, austere, and devoted to battle. Battle, in this case, might be taken literally, but in most cases it isn't. Like I said, fascism was about bringing the civilian world around to the military mindset. And so, 
All tasks in fascist life, even the most basic domestic ones, are treated with the mentality of the warrior, where struggle is embraced and victory is celebrated. The fascist warrior understands that in postponing immediate pleasure and satisfaction and putting himself through pain, he can come out the other side a truly free man. The highest virtue is to bring honor and glory to your nation. And this is something that might be scorned by a lot of people, and I can understand why. I don't like the military either. I don't like all of the wars that militaries start. And I don't like that the concepts of honor and glory are often used to justify violence or simply to bully people. Like the person who is pressured into getting married because it would bring honor to his family. I don't like how Prince Zuko felt pressured to chase after the Avatar for three years to regain his lost honor. But that's just it. Zuko only believed that he lost his honor after the Agni Kai with his father. Iroh knew from the beginning that Zuko always had honor in him all along, and that he only needed to discover his own inner sense of honor to fully manifest himself. In other words, it's not the honor that's the problem. It's not the fixation on honor that's the problem, but it's the need to have your own honor justified by an unjust authority. Honor and glory are not in themselves bad concepts, and applying the warrior mentality to life isn't a bad idea either. In fact, I like these ideas quite a lot. I just don't like when they are exploited for bad purposes. Having a sense of honor about your own life, feeling honored in your community, and honoring other people and institutions can be a very constructive thing. And celebrating your victories is also very important. The military mindset is not necessarily thuggish or brutal. It is masculine, for sure, but it doesn't have to be toxic masculinity, if that makes sense. There are ways we can approach these fascist values without necessarily bringing out the worst in them. And also, just because these values are traditionally conceived of as masculine, they, that doesn't mean that they cannot be taken up or shouldn't be taken up by women as well. I think it goes without saying that women can benefit from living this warrior mentality just as much as men. And in fact, this has been encouraged within fascism in the past. Oswald Mosley was a big believer in women's suffrage and women's representation through the corporative system and women's activity and participation in the fascist civic life. And also the first British fascist movement ever before the BUF of Oswald Mosley was headed by a woman. Although I want to point out something, uh, which is that uh, Rothel Barrel Lintorn Lintorn Orman, which is <laughs> this woman's name, um, she, I, she wasn't really so much a fascist as just an anti-communist who started... Uh, calling herself a fascist and acquiring this fascist club around her uh, because all of them wanted to take down communism and root communism out of society, much more so than any actual interest in the doctrine of fascism. Another key word in describing the fascist ethic or ethos is action. This is closely connected to the idea of living dangerously. To live your fullest, most vital existence, you must exist in a state of motion. Life must be dynamic, and action must be pursued. And that is critical to the health of the nation, because only through strong and decisive action can the needs of the nation be addressed, especially in complicated, changing times like the early 20th century. This is one of the reasons why fascism is skeptical of democracy. Under Italian fascism, a modified fascist version of parliamentary democracy was preserved for the first four years, but was ultimately undermined entirely in 1926 when Mussolini declared himself the Duce and assumed dictatorial powers. In British fascism, Democracy is preserved in a system similar to what the Italians had before 1926. The parliament is elected along corporative lines rather than geographical ones, 
and has the ability to accept or reject government proposals. The executive government is streamlined into a core group of elected ministers who have much more power to act quickly and decisively. All of this is in the name of action. Democracy is slow, and it often undermines the will of the people because of the plutocracy's iron grip over the politicians. Rather than referring to liberal democratic countries as democracies, fascists usually call them plutocracies, because that's what they are. Fascism sees through the fiction of representative democracy, and instead claims that the fascist system represents the true will of the nation better than any crony capitalist parliament could ever hope to. Even Italian fascism considered itself more democratic than representative democracy because they believed they were expressing the actual will of the population, taking into account the needs of not only the plutocrats as under liberalism, not only the proletarians as under socialism, but the entire nation as a whole. I like the British system a lot more, even though it never actually got implemented. And generally, British fascism was a bit more liberal than Italian fascism, which I like. But it was still authentically fascist, because it understood the core values of fascism and just interpreted them a little differently for the needs of a different country, which, after all, is perfectly sensible, given the fact that fascism is particularist rather than universalist. Here's another quote from Mosley reflecting on fascism in 1967. I use the term democracy in what seems the pejorative sense, no doubt in reaction to the experience of government through which I had recently passed. It was my habit during only a brief period, for it soon seemed to me clear that democracy in its true sense, government of the people by the people for the people as an expression of the natural healthy will of the people when free from the deception of financial politics was exactly what we wanted. It was the perversion of democracy and not democracy itself which we condemned. What I subsequently called financial democracy and in my denunciation of the system I always used that phrase, arguing that the power of money within the prevailing system invariably prevented the fulfillment of the people's will, which was the essence of true democracy. We do not propose dictatorship because the control of an elected parliament is still retained, but we do propose a drastic revision of the parliamentary machine in order that the will of the people may be carried out. We have no real democracy at the present time because again and again since the war, the country has voted for great changes and for decisive action. Yet again and again, their will has been thwarted by obstruction in the talking shop at Westminster. So Mosley's form of British fascism was not anti-democratic at all. It was just a different kind of democracy that represented the population more organically through the corporations or fascist occupational syndicates, rather than the traditional system of geographical constituencies. And then that parliament would elect a government that could actually get things done instead of sitting around debating on what should be done. Another reason why fascism was skeptical of democracy was that democracy encouraged division. There is no unity of purpose under democracy. Under democracy, everyone's vote counts for only himself, and the people are encouraged to vote for whichever candidates they think will benefit them and their interests the most. There is significant disagreement, and this disagreement is turned into fodder for political feuds, which distract people and take away attention from the fact that very little is actually getting done. Fascism understood that action could only be achieved through unity of purpose and sought to create a new kind of politics that was anti-politics. Now, my problem with this is that without any form of democratic representation, you don't really have unity of purpose. You just have a unitary autocracy. It's one thing to have a government that can act decisively. It's an entirely different thing to have a country that is united behind the same purpose as that government. That's why I prefer the British system, which attempted to preserve some civic participation in government through the corporative parliament, 
which did have the ability to check the power of the executive, which I think is important. As much as I admire fascism's drive to action, it's also important that you have some limitations on the government. All expressions of fascism are motivated by the concept of action, but British fascism was especially interested in action. Oswald Mosley had a newspaper called Action. Their logo with the flash in the circle represented action through unity. Mosley was tr attracted to fascism for its ability to act because he had a huge and ambitious economic plan that he wanted to enact, but nobody was interested in helping him because it was way too ambitious for most politicians to even understand. Now, I do not suggest that Italian methods and practices should be imported here. But I do suggest that we need in this country to wake up as they woke up. We need a new movement, a modern movement of youth, of energy, of manhood. He was a friend of John Maynard Keynes and adopted the Keynesian model of economics well before most people had even heard of it. And he went beyond it into new territories where the government would have a decisive input on wages and prices in order to control the flow of cash and would encourage development of home industries so that Britain could develop some economic independence with the aid of its vast empire. It was a great idea, but it was just too big for the time, especially when even the Labour Party was still operating under the neoclassical theory that when a recession hit, the only thing you could do was sit back and wait for the market to resolve itself. Oswald Mosley was a proponent of what Thomas Sowell disparagingly calls do something economics. When we're in trouble, the government needs to do something to help us. And so when the Great Depression hit the United Kingdom and his proposals were again rejected by the Labour Party, he left and created the new party. And then he took a trip to Italy, got inspired by fascism and formed the BUF. Action, and specifically economic action, was Mosley's driving purpose as a politician, and he continued to dream big even after he was arrested and the fascist movement was dissolved. In 1948, he started Union Movement, which sought to rescue Great Britain from the fall of the British Empire by incorporating it into a large pan-European nation-state that could compete with other large powers of the United States and the Soviet Union, and eventually Japan, as Mosley, like many other people at the time, predicted that Japan would have a renaissance of power and influence in the post-imperial Showa era. Although nowadays, people have realized that what we really should have been looking at was China this whole time. I really like Oswald Mosley for the most part. I certainly like him more than Benny Boy over here. I think his heart was usually in the right place, but he ran into some problems along the way, mostly relating to racism and anti-Semitism that severely overshadowed any potential good that the British public could see in his movement. Mosley had a complicated relationship with these issues that I am largely ignorant about because I've only really read his perspective about that stuff, and I haven't done a lot of research about that era area of his legacy. I think there's a good chance that Mosley has been somewhat misunderstood about these issues, but I also think he contributed a lot to that misunderstanding by bringing a lot of heat on himself through his own words and actions. Now, in all of this, you've been going on, on about all of this, and you've been dealing with the, with the various points that have come mm -hmm. up, but now you are saying absolutely definitely that anybody who was guilty of anti-Semitism was expelled from your party and so on. How can you possibly say that as if you expect people to believe it uh, when everybody who watched the events of the 30s, whoever you talk to, knows and associates your party totally with racial hatred and anti-Semitism? Either what you're saying is not true or you were the most ineffectual put upon, unable to impose his leadership on a party, mm. leader, that has ever been seen. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack, and I don't have time for it in this video. I will make a future series of videos about Mosley and British fascism, where I will address all of the nuances of that situation. All I will say is that if we remove these issues from the conversation, the essence of Mosley's fascism was something I could get behind, at least in spirit.
Another thing I like about Mosley is his embrace of science. It's a little odd that a philosophy which positioned itself against rationalism and positivism would so wholeheartedly embrace the scientific profession, but I get the sense that Mosley was not exactly the most religious person ever. Same with Mussolini, actually. In fact, there's good evidence that Mussolini was an atheist, seeing how he was an atheist back when he was a Marxist and he laid out all of his reasons for it in an old essay of his. But even so, believing that there is more to life than hard materials is no reason to reject the study of those hard materials. And one very progressive aspect of Mosley's fascism was its belief that science should not only be promoted and adhered to, but integrated into the government in a formal way. That in the 20th century, it is necessary to have a government that responds to the scientific community so that they can work together to solve the nation's problems. And this is a great idea. Back then, they might not have known about the greenhouse effect, but they certainly knew about epidemics. The Spanish flu took a huge toll on Europe at the time. With proper scientific guidance and state direction, an epidemic would not be able to rage through society the way it did back then. And the way it did now. And with the current climate catastrophe at the moment, a fascist government would be the government best equipped to tackle a problem of this magnitude on a systemic level, just as Mosley sought to tackle the economic problem on a systemic level. There's this funny little German movie called Look Who's Back, where Hitler randomly appears in the 21st century after shooting himself in the head in 1945, and he starts reading the newspapers. He comes to the conclusion that the Green Party is the best choice at the moment due to their stance on environmentalism, which I find very interesting because the Green Party in all other respects has nothing to do with Hitler's ideology. But I think it's funny that even though this movie doesn't portray Hitler as a good guy, they at least portray him as someone with sensible priorities. But this embrace of science and integration of science into the government does appeal to my more elitist side, because one thing I detest about the right in America is its empty, vacuous form of populism, which really just amounts to a dumbing down to the lowest common denominator in the vain belief that actually being intelligent is a form of elitism. Well, call me an elitist then, because I don't want to live in a country full of stupid people who reject science because they believe they are doing their own research. Yeah, want to get some peer review on that research? And no, that doesn't mean likes on Facebook. I actually lean more technocratic than democratic in some ways, and I'm not really sure what to do about that, but I think a government by scientists and historians is a lot more preferable to a government by rednecks and Giuliani's, and I think we should be doing a lot more to encourage that kind of government. And all of this scientific and technological side of fascism was definitely a part of fascism's DNA, as it was not a backwards-looking ideology, as most people tend to assume, but a forward-thinking ideology. Productivism, autarky, and the advancement of science are all a part of the fascist mentality, which valued self-sufficiency and independence from the rest of the world, kind of like North Korea's Juche ideology. Which brings us back to Mosley. Mosley's fascism was primarily economic, so he put a lot of emphasis on the corporative system as his big sales pitch. And while I do like the idea of it in abstract, I just don't think it's quite as good as market socialism. Now, maybe I'm wrong and market socialism is complete bullshit. And actually, I do have my own reservations about the system, so I am by no means a diehard believer in socialism, but I prefer it to corporatism, and here's why. Under corporatism, private capital is preserved, which means the power of capital is preserved. Now, it's true that corporatism was designed to address the problem of private capital, but as long as private capital exists, it will always be able to assert its influence on the government through its wealth. What I'm saying is that there was machinery in place under corporatism to prevent the plutocratic domination of society, but there was no machinery to prevent plutocratic domination of that machinery and the subsequent subversion of the machinery's purpose. 
I don't mind the idea of private capital in the abstract, and I do think it's a good idea to work with what you have and so that you don't disrupt things too much, but I just don't like the consequences that come with it. Now, would I prefer this system to what we have currently in my country? Perhaps. It has been pointed out before that the Scandinavian system that the progressive wing of America is in love with is actually a form of corporatism, although it isn't run by the state. The reason being that Scandinavian countries don't have a lot of labor laws, but what they do have is cooperation between capital and the unions. How this was accomplished, I don't know. Those of you familiar with Scandinavian political economy could let me know. But one thing you lose when you adopt the fascist corporate model is the independence of the labor unions. The plus side of this is that it eliminates some of the nastier parts of labor disputes, like strikes and lockouts, which not only divide the country against itself through class warfare, but also slow down the economy. But the downside is that without independent labor unions, you really have to put a lot of faith in the ability of the arbiters to give a fair deal to labor in any disputes, and I'm sorry, but I just don't trust it. In fact, I'm left-wing enough that I pretty much think the union should be given literally everything they want at all times, so I'm probably never going to be happy with a compromise like this. But the capitalists might be comfortable because there's no strikes and the deals they will get out of the fascist labor unions will be much more amenable to them, which is why they showed so much support to the fascists in 1919 when they were first coming up. Overall, the corporative system is a compromise, and compromises can sometimes be more compromising to one person's interest than the other. As someone skeptical of corporatism, uh, I called it a compromise here but uh, i don't mean to really put too much of a fine point on that idea because you know we we've already talked about how the nordic model um does seem to work pretty well and that is a variant of corporatism and um also you know corporatism Going back to the 19th century, I mean, it, it predates national syndicalism by a lot, and um, it was it it was an attitude, it was an idea developed by some more kind of socially conservative people who were looking for an alternative to capitalism, but it's not simply just an, an economic model, and that's something important to point out that I that I kind of skipped over in this video it really is also just um like a social idea um it's an idea for how people of different groups can get along with each other and collaborate for their mutual benefit and it's an idea that also kind of harkens back to the medieval guilds so there's a lot that goes into this idea it does have uh quite a bit of history to it and uh, i'll be exploring that in later videos however it's worth pointing out that at least in the case of british fascism although perhaps in italian fascism too corporatism was not the only element of their economic scheme they had many more ideas for how to increase purchasing power in the country and create a robust self-sustaining economy that would make even the lowest paying jobs worth their while. And even if I am not totally comfortable with the corporative system, I can at least admire it for what it set out to do. For one thing, it tried to make it more possible and imminently practicable to achieve a kind of economic representation that democratic socialism could only offer in theory. So in that way, fascism could be a more realistic version of socialism. It's also worth mentioning that the whole cooperative model of economy is relatively untested, especially on a large scale. The socialist solution to the problem of capital is imaginative enough that it beggars belief because there just isn't the practical experience to back it up, whereas the corporative model is something that we pretty much already have today in Scandinavia. It doesn't require changing the whole power structure of the economy, so it's way more feasible in the short run.
And to put this in more philosophical terms, the fascists were very concerned with uniting the national community, and this meant that they wanted to abolish what Marxists call class consciousness. They wanted to get people to stop thinking of themselves as proletarians fighting against their capitalist overlords and start thinking of themselves as Italians or Brits fighting against whichever foreign enemy they encountered or not fighting against anyone but fighting for their country. I am a big fan of unity and finding common ground with people you disagree with, so on that level, I can really admire the fascist national consciousness in opposition to Marxist class consciousness. And I've never really been fully comfortable with the way Marxism pits people against each other and demonizes the people termed reactionaries. But there is one fatal flaw with this scheme. Class is a real thing. I wouldn't mind it if fascism at least admitted to the reality of class, even if they wanted to move people's thoughts away from what divides us and toward what unites us. That is a perfectly sensible idea. But the fascists essentially just cover their eyes and ears and pretend that class doesn't exist, which is the same thing conservatives do. We can think about race in the same way. Something I disagree with about social justice warriors, and we all know how much I love them, is over the idea of colorblindness. Colorblindness is the idea that we shouldn't see a person's race, that race should be overlooked or ignored, and we should focus on other things about them. Like when Martin Luther King said he had a dream that people would be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. Now, the social justice warriors disagree with Martin Luther King. They believe that colorblindness is wrong, because if we don't see race, then we are ignoring all of the systemic oppression that comes from race. You see, the left denies the reality of race, but they do not deny the reality of race as class, and neither do I, which is why it's confusing when social justice warriors conflate that with colorblindness which is about moving past the concept of race in hopes that that will move us past the paradigm of race as class. But where they are correct in criticizing colorblindness is when it is taken up by conservatives like Dennis Prager. As you can see, I have very white skin. And I don't. Conservatives will call themselves colorblind and exalt the virtue of not seeing race, but they will do it in an effort to undermine the idea of race as class. They will claim that we as a country have moved beyond race altogether and that racism is no longer a problem. That is basically what the fascists are doing with economic class. Instead of recognizing that it exists and then looking to move the country beyond it, they just pretend it doesn't exist in the first place. All that does in the end is empower the upper class even more. If you deny that systemic oppression exists, it is not the oppressors who have to face the consequences of that. Fascism therefore offered a lopsided promise of national unity that may have benefited the proletariat to some degree, but didn't really have the machinery to ensure that. But speaking of machinery, let's talk about futurism and the impact that it had on fascist art, because another thing I admire about fascism is its aesthetic which is another thing that separates it from purely reactionary movements. The aesthetic of fascist art is very modern, and it belongs to that early 20th century movement of painterly aesthetics that includes German Expressionism, Cubism, and of course, Italian Futurism. It's a rebellious breakaway from the 19th century realism and Impressionism. Geometry, machinery, metallic textures, stark shading, fast-paced energy and motion, and a rejection of everything nostalgic characterize the futurist style of painting. You can definitely see a continuity between that style and much of the art of fascism, which emphasized iconography, speed, and strength, portraying the fascist nation as a faceless mass of mechanistic warriors and presenting Mussolini's face in low angles, emphasizing the geometry of his robust features to make him look statuesque. You can even see an example of the fascist aesthetic in this newspaper of mine. 
an issue of Il Popolo d'Italia from 1936, where labor is made into iconography, emphasizing the proletarian, working-class spirit of fascism and promoting an ethic of hard work, portraying the Italian laborer as if he were made of steel, a part of this grand industrial construction of the modern world. Civiltà del lavoro, year 15 of the civilization of labor. Fascism also incorporated some art deco elements, which reminds me of the Fleischer Brothers Superman cartoons, which represented Metropolis in a way that resembled, well, Metropolis from the Fritz Lang German Expressionist movie of the same name. Actually, Superman himself as a model of pure masculine excellence and communitarian virtue definitely has a bit of a fascist tinge to him, wouldn't you say? It also reminds me a little bit of socialist realism, which is the primary art style of the Soviet Union, Maoist China, and North Korea. Even though it was a part of the realist school of art and thus was very different from fascist art, it still communicated its ideas in a similar way. Like with fascist art, socialist realism was meant to communicate a proletarian ideal to a large population of workers. It meant to celebrate the act of labor and cultivate belief in the ideal of the new man, which was an aspect of both communist and fascist thought, similar to the Superman. Not the comic book hero Superman, although he is, as we have discussed, an expression of this early 20th century ideal, but the Nietzschean Übermensch, and of course, the later reinterpretation of that concept under Hitler and his belief in the Aryan master race. In any case, whether we interpret racism into it or not, we see in the various political art movements of this era an effort to push a modern, industrial, progressive view of society. That is, a paradigm that sees society as a perpetual struggle and work in progress. A campaign not dissimilar to a war, but the victory conditions of this war are not external, rather internal. Nations, or the international proletariat, as in the case of communism, lifting themselves up to achieve greater heights and a higher plane of evolution, whether we are speaking in literal, biological terms, or merely philosophical ones. So in the end, what is it that I admire about fascism? To start, I admire the fact that fascism recognized the limits of rationality and reason, and that there is more to the human animal than simple logic, otherwise we'd be computers. I admire the fact that fascism sought to rescue the spiritual needs of man in an era where God was becoming increasingly obsolete through a secularized form of religion that does what religion is supposed to do, as etymologically the word religion comes from the Latin word religare, which means to bind. I admire the fact that fascism sought to put an end to man as the monolith. And this is something that socialism strives for, too. For instance, one of my favorite movies is a film called Penda's Fen, which has major anarchist themes in it. And a quote that I adore from that film is, Revolt from the monolith. Come back to the village. This can be applied to anarchism just as well as to fascism. In either case, we are removing mankind from the mentality of being an individual carving out a space for himself in the cold, competitive wilderness and orienting man toward a communitarian conception of life where membership in one's community entails service and devotion to that community. And I think that is a beautiful thing. I admire that fascism promoted a spirit of self-sacrifice and Spartan minimalism. I admire that fascism took the concepts of traditional masculinity, bravery, heroism, and vitality, and oriented them toward the collective, thus integrating a more stoic, ancient Roman kind of virtue into a more socialistic and communitarian conception of politics fitting for the 20th century. I admire that even though fascism sought to preserve the traditional racial consciousness of the nation, it didn't want to regress into a reactionary conservatism, and instead, fascism was forward-thinking, looking to create a new vision for what society could be in a new century, embracing modern science and technology. 
I admire that fascism valued action and applying the activist spirit to the economic sphere, creating a new kind of economy that could be directed by the state while also preserving the vital machinery of the market. I admire that fascism was skeptical of happiness and saw true meaning in life as something manifested through living for a transcendent purpose rather than found through searching for happiness. I admire that fascism moved away from the politics of separate interests and towards a new kind of politics that was anti-politics, focusing on uniting the country behind a single common interest. I admire the fact that it recognized the power of the state as potential for cultivating a great, virtuous society rather than as a simple weapon for blunt control or as a night watchman. These are all things to admire, I think, although many of these values do seem kind of square from a modern lens. Some people might think this all sounds a bit self-serious and old-fashioned, and I will admit that fascism is a product of its time. I mean, this ideology was invented before people discovered LSD, so it's kind of tense and humorless. Like, fascism kind of assumes that everybody's walking around with a giant stick up their ass all the time, and the people who don't might feel that the whole thing is a bit overwrought. And I can understand that. And as much as I do admire that stuff, there is also, of course, a lot that I don't like about fascism. I don't like fascism's absolute sincerity of belief, because I think it clouds proper judgment. I don't like fascism's rejection of positivism. I don't like how the concept of the ethical state became a bludgeon for traditional masculinity to become toxic masculinity, and how it was used to confirm bigoted social values like racism, the hatred of homosexuality, and a very poorly thought out demographic campaign. I don't like how the fascist battle ethic was literalized into a pro-war philosophy. I don't like how the interests of labor unions were softened or even subverted under the fascist syndicates. I don't like how democracy was undermined in both the political and economic spheres. I don't like its lack of skepticism of power. I don't like how it was made a virtue to not think for yourself, and I don't like the fascist credo credere, obbedire, combattere, believe, obey, fight. It is the obbedire part that I take special issue with. This is a criticism that even Julius Evola offered. If fascism is supposed to elevate the nation to a collective of Spartan warriors, what good does it do to render them in blind obedient service as if they were helots? A warrior isn't a slave, a warrior is a free man who defends his own country by his own volition because he is noble. But what good is it to have a nation of supposedly free men when we all have to do exactly as Il Duce commands? In the case of Evola's criticism specifically, he brought up the fact that Mussolini's ministers and advisors were often reluctant to question his judgment or disagree with him. You know that phrase, two heads are better than one? Well, what good is that if all the other heads are afraid to speak their mind because fucking Duce over here thinks he's hot shit? Obedience isn't something I value. Putting your ugly mug on the front of a building like some Orwellian nightmare is not something I admire. A big, stupid, ugly, papier-mâché big brother staring down at a crowd of simpletons mindlessly shouting, See! 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 Is, forgive me, not something that fills me with a lot of confidence. As much as I like confidence, there is a difference between confidence and gross megalomania. Nobility, gallantry, doing the right thing even if it breaks a few rules, that I believe is true virtue. So what are we left with then? A system of good values where every good value in it is corrupted by a dark mirror of itself? A set of great ideas that are ruined by people who believe in them way too hard, resulting in a lack of restraint and self-awareness? A dynamic, revolutionary vision for a new way of life that was tainted by egotism and barbaric brutality. A half-baked utopia. And if you know anything about baking, you know that utopia is like a souffle. 
it's definitely not a recipe you want to get wrong, because if you get the slightest measurement off, you'll end up with an unworkable pile of shit. If you're wondering why I'm obsessed with fascism, this is why. I see fascism not as a study of the failure of intellect and a great societal sickness, but as a heroic tragedy, as what could have been great but contained within its very germ the fatal flaws that undermined its own potential. And you might not agree with me. You might be a fascist who genuinely believes the entire fascist creed and thinks that if only the fascists had won the war, we would be living in a better world. Or, more likely, you might be a man of the third estate, who has a totally different vision of what a prosperous society looks at, wherein the virtues of fascism don't hold any resonance. And that's okay, I'm not trying to tell you you're wrong or convince you of a different way of thinking. But it's good to look at our options, and not be afraid to dream a little big, just as long as we temper our dreams with a good bit of common sense and rationality. It's interesting when you notice the contrast at play here an ideology of national unity that is also identitarian. At once, we have an ideology that promotes unity and division. In modern times, most people who are genuinely interested in fascism as a political option are identitarians, and so the message of unity usually takes a back seat to the message of division because it is immigration that these people care about the most. But what if we were to do a little revisionism and expound on the parts of fascism that we like to create a different kind of doctrine for the 21st century rather than the 20th century? That kind of thing isn't out of the ordinary. Political ideologies undergo revisions all the time, but fascism just kind of got stuck in time because World War II destroyed its viability as a movement. Since then, it has only been popular among a very small group of intellectuals who appreciate its more philosophical elements and a much larger group of identitarians for its ideas pertaining to racial consciousness. But I don't know how much attention has been given to what I consider the more interesting aspects of the ideology that have kind of been either forgotten about or locked into one particular framing that has robbed it of its potential to evolve and influence other systems of thought. I mean, fascism itself is a syncretic ideology, so it makes sense that it would be able to produce other syncretisms with other kinds of ideology if it had been given the space to influence those ideas. So I guess that's why I made this video. I want to put these ideas out there in the world again, framed from a different point of view, so that they might help clarify some aspects of our political philosophy. That way we can have a more complete record of our intellectual heritage, and more ideas to draw from in formulating a proper worldview. And if that sounds interesting to you, find some other philosophy out there that maybe doesn't get very much attention or gets a lot of negative attention, and look at it in a new way. Bring something out of it that other people wouldn't expect. There's a lot out there that we just don't explore in our narrow Overton window, and it would be great to free ourselves from that paradigm. I'm loving the way socialism has been freed from the Cold War prison it was in for so many years in this country, due to the work of people like Noam Chomsky, Richard Wolff, Slavoj Zizek, Bernie Sanders, and all the people on YouTube who have made very helpful videos exploring socialist theory and history. When good ideas are allowed to play, we have better sportsmanship and a fairer game. You know, I've been using this image a lot in this video just because I think it's really funny. Um, but I think this might be the Mosley version of that image. <laughs> just, uh, I think he's saluting a group of female black shirts in this, uh, photo. Uh, I can't remember, but man, I just look at that grin, man. It's so good.